all the living shelled animals in the shallow waters of the Atlantic and Gulf Coast, we interact most with blue crabs. Blue crabs fascinate us because through them we have personal contact with marine creatures whose mysterious lives are so alien to our own. Just about everyone who lives near or visits the coast becomes involved with blue crabs in one way or another. Some encounter them while swimming. Others participate in one of coastal America's favorite pastimes, crabbing. Crabs can be caught by all ages using inexpensive devices like the crab basket seen here. In a relatively short period of time, enough crabs can be caught to provide the whole family with one of the world's finest seafoods. Commercial crabbers and crab processors make this delicacy available to people everywhere. Blue crabs inhabit the shallow, sandy, mud-bottomed waters of marsh creeks, sounds, and nearshore oceans. Crabs feed on just about anything alive or dead that they come across. Crabs are alert and aggressive creatures. As you can see, crabs are just as assertive out of water as they are in the water. The word crabby says it all. The life cycle and behavior of blue crabs are similar to most other crustaceans such as shrimp and lobster. Blue crabs are a member of the family Portunidae, the swimming crabs, which are unique among crabs because their last pair of walking legs are modified into paddles which give them their swimming ability. Males can be identified by their narrow aprons. Females have broad, semicircular aprons. And pre-adult or virgin females have triangle-shaped aprons. During their active periods, mature males tend to inhabit the tidal creeks, while the females are found in open waters surrounding the barrier islands. When the pre-adult females are ready for breeding, they move into the creeks where the males are abundant. Females are attracted to the chemical substances called pheromones produced by the males. The female sits quietly as the male approaches. Notice how she uses her paddle to waft water that has been in contact with her body toward him. The male gathers her underneath him and carries her in this way for several days. Crabs in this stage are called doublers. Now you can see that the female has just shed. While her shell is still soft, the female turns over so that she can be inseminated by the male. The sperm is transported to the female through these two whisker-like intermittent organs seen under his apron. The intermittent organs enter these openings under her apron and deposit the sperm into seminal receptacles. The sperm may be retained in the seminal receptacles for more than a year and may be used to fertilize several sets of eggs. A female crab breeds only once during her lifetime and the shed that occurs at that time is her last. Growth in body size for her stops at this point. Males, on the other hand, shed, grow, and breed throughout their lifetimes. After insemination, the male carries the female in the typical doubler fashion for about a day, which allows sufficient time for her shell to harden. This ensures the female is not released while her shell is still soft and vulnerable. After breeding, the females return from the tidal creeks to open waters. As the weather cools over the winter months, all of the crabs move into deeper nearshore waters and burrow into the mud where they are better protected from the colder surface waters. During the cooler months, the females produce eggs. As you can see from this winter crab, whose shell has been removed, red-colored eggs, or roe, occupy much of the crab's body cavity. In spring, the eggs are transferred to the outside of the body underneath the apron through the openings of the seminal receptacles seen here. 
As the eggs pass through the seminal receptacles, they are fertilized by the sperm stored in the receptacles. The eggs are tightly packed into a large orange-colored spongy pad which is held under the crab's apron. Females during this stage are often called sponge crabs. The eggs are retained for about a week while the crab larvae develop inside. These are eggs taken from the sponge female we saw on the dock, now viewed under the microscope. There are about one to two million eggs contained in a sponge. The dark areas inside the eggs are the developing embryos. Toward the end of the week, the egg pad turns dark gray just before hatching takes place. Here are the developing zoea larva about a week later. Notice the large dark eyes. It is the eyes that darken the entire egg pad just before hatching takes place. Here is a newly hatched zoea, the first free swimming larval stage of the blue crab. Notice its long dorsal spine and well-developed abdomen or tail. The presence of the tail gives the zoea a more shrimp-like appearance than that of a crab. It is this appearance that leads zoologists to believe that crabs evolved from a shrimp-like ancestor. The zoea even uses its tail for swimming, much the same as a shrimp. Here is a front view of a zoea. Notice its beating heart below the dorsal spine. The delicate fan-like tips of its legs are especially adapted for swimming. Zoea spend their month to six week lifespan drifting with other plankton in open nearshore waters. Like other plankters, zoea are consumed in vast numbers by a wide variety of predators and filter feeders. This is why a single female has to produce close to two million eggs in order for a dozen or so crabs to reach maturity. On the other hand, an advantage to having planktonic larvae is that the species can be widely dispersed with the ocean currents. After seven sheds, the zoea turns into a second larval stage called a megalops. The megalops appears more crab-like with its enlarged body and reduced tail. In this stage, the tail still retains some swimming capability. The megalops is about one sixteenth of an inch in size, which makes it difficult to view the entire animal under the microscope. Notice that the tail is held partially folded under the body. In adult crabs, the tail loses its function as a swimming organ, and as we have seen, functions in reproduction. In this context, we have been referring to the crab's tail as an apron. The front legs of the megalops have now developed into claws. You can see that the tips of the walking legs are now pointed. Pointed legs are adapted for crawling and grasping, suitable to the bottom dwelling existence of the megalops and adult blue crabs. Notice that unlike the adult blue crab, the last leg is pointed and similar to the other walking legs. This distinct larval feature indicates that the blue crab had a crawling crab ancestor and that the evolution of swimming paddles occurred at a later time. The megalops migrates from open waters to its nursery grounds in the backwaters of the salt marsh. In a little over a week or two, depending on the water temperature, the megalops undergoes its one and only shed to become a tiny adult crab. A newly arrived adult crab is about one-eighth inch in size. You can see that the crab increases by about one-third of its body size with each shed. It takes about 20 sheds in a period of a year for a female blue crab to reach sexual maturity. At this point, growth for her discontinues. As we have said, males continue to shed and grow long after sexual maturity allowing them to attain their greatest size, as you see by comparing the sizes of the male and the female crabs here. If all goes well with these crabs, they may live three years or more. 
Blue crabs generate in excess of $100 million in sales in the United States annually. The existence of sandy barrier islands, marshes, and sounds support a thriving blue crab fishery in the middle and southeastern Atlantic states and the states bordering the Gulf of Mexico. In most areas today, crabs are caught commercially in vinyl-coated chicken wire traps. Crabs attracted to the bait enter through the muzzle and crawl into the upper compartment. There they become sufficiently disoriented so that they are unable to escape quickly. In the event of a crab trap becoming lost or untended, most crabs will eventually find their way out after the bait is consumed. Let's join Daryl, a resident crabber who is about to make a run to check his traps. During the prime season, the traps are pulled each day. An electric pot hauler takes a lot of the work out of pulling the traps into the boat. Trap is dumped, rebaited, and set out again. Scrap fish is the most frequently used bait. Most commercially harvested crabs are taken to crab processing plants where they are purchased, weighed, picked, and processed. At this point, Darrell sells his crabs to the processing plant. Now let's see how crabs increase in value as they move through the plant. A thousand to a thousand five hundred pounds of live crabs are loaded into two stainless steel baskets inside a large pressure cooker called a steam retort. Crabs are cooked for about 20 minutes in pressurized steam at 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Baskets are hoisted from the retort, moved to the backing room and left until they are cool enough to handle. Crab meat is picked and sorted into selected grades for marketing. Although crab meat can be extracted by machines, the best quality claw and body meat is still produced by hand picking. Crab pickers are highly skilled workers and often are paid by the amount of crab meat they produce. There are three grades of body meat. Jumbo lump is the meat taken from the back fin, which is the muscle that propels the back fin or paddle. This grade brings the highest price. Lump is a lower priced product containing smaller flakes of body meat, including some back fin. And special contains smaller flakes of body meat and is the least expensive of the three. Meat removed from the claws is lower priced and is marketed as two products, claw meat and cocktail claws. Only about 10% of the crab's weight is recovered as crab meat. The remaining byproducts are often dried in large ovens like the drum dryer seen here and sold as chicken feed and fertilizers. The soft-shelled crab industry, an offshoot of the blue crab fishery, generates more than $20 million annually and is growing rapidly. In order to better understand how soft-shell crabs occur, let's take a look at the crab shedding process. Several weeks before shedding, crabs manufacture a new soft exoskeleton, or shell, underneath the old shell. Here we have boiled a crab to show better the developing shell. As shedding begins, fracture lines, or points where the shell breaks, deepen. Notice that what appears to be two lines below the eyes and above the claws 
are the edges of shell that have already started to separate from a fracture line. The crab is expanding her body with water, which forces the old shells apart. Here is a view of the same female crab from behind. You can see that the upper shell has already separated and is rising. Now you can see that the tips of the shell have withdrawn and are still pointed outward in the direction from which they came. Here the apron has been withdrawn and the paddle feet are starting to come out. From the side view, we can see her legs working free. Finally, she struggles to withdraw her large claws. She is free, a new creation. Now you can see how much larger the newly emerged female is than her shedded shell. As we look inside the shell, we see that it is quite hollow. The darker areas here are the old gill coverings left behind with the shell. From what we have seen, it is impossible for crabs and other crustaceans to grow beyond the confines of their shells without first shedding the old shell and replacing it with a larger one. Here we see just how soft the new shell really is. With her soft shell and limited ability to move about, she is totally vulnerable to predators and to cannibalism from harder crabs. For this reason, the soft crab remains inactive and hidden while her shell hardens. In about 12 to 24 hours, the shell becomes hard enough for the crab to return to active life. Crabs at this stage in their shedding cycle are marketed as soft-shelled crabs. What makes soft-shell crabs so attractive is that the rich taste of crab meat may be enjoyed with little cooking or preparation time, since everything in the soft-shelled crab purchased at the market is eaten. Soft-shell crabs are obtained through the capture of hard crabs that are close to shedding. These crabs are called peelers. Since our principal way of obtaining peelers is by selecting them from our regular catch of hard crabs, it becomes important for the crabber to recognize the telltale signs that identify peelers. The new soft shell can be seen forming underneath the old shell of the last segment of the paddle fin. It first appears as a thin white line just inside the margin of the last segment. This is called a white line peeler. And at this point, shedding should take place in seven to 10 days. As the time for molting draws closer, the white line becomes pink and eventually turns red. A red line peeler will be shedding in one to three days. Another reliable sign of a peeler is a purple color on the triangular apron of an immature female crab. This color appears when she is about to undergo her final molt before she becomes mature. One other good sign is a new forming limb bud. These buds are soft. This is actually a new limb being formed. When she sheds, it will be smaller than the others, but it will be a new appendage. Peelers are placed into crab shedding tanks where they shed over the next two to three days. The recently shedded crabs must be removed from the water within four hours after shedding or their shells become too tough to be marketed as soft shell crabs. After the soft shell crabs are removed from the shedding tanks, they're either dressed and frozen or kept alive in refrigerators. When refrigerated, Crabs stop their shell development, and they stay alive in a dormant state for several days. In this state, they are packed in coolers and shipped all over the United States. Soft-shell crabs, properly wrapped and frozen, will keep their delicious flavor for up to four months, which makes them well-suited for a world market. For several weeks after shedding, 
Crabs will eat and grow, filling out their new shells with flesh and muscle. Recently shed crabs are usually brightly colored with pristine white bellies. Often referred to as white bellies, these lightweight hollow crabs provide a meager repast because what little meat there is in them is soft and watery. Crabbers often refer to them as tin cans. Eventually, crabs fill out to become heavier meat-filled crabs of high market value, often called fat crabs. Fat crabs are not as brightly colored as recently shed crabs and have an ivory hue to their bellies. They often have brown spots on their bellies as well, which indicate that they've had their shells long enough for brown colored algae to grow on them. Crabbers often call them rusty crabs. Older crabs, like this one, become very rusty and often have other creatures growing on them, like the barnacle here and the oyster growing over one eye. They have had their shells for a long time and are not likely to shed again before they die. Due to the heavy losses from natural predators and man, few crabs reach the age of this old timer. We have had a look at the lives of the blue crab and the industry is working with them. With the great influx of people to our coast, more and more of our shorefront acreage is being developed and more boats are utilizing our waters. More than ever, we must watch and protect our marshes, sounds, and near shore islands so that they will continue to support blue crabs and the marine life so vital to the life of the oceans.